to you today about standardized testing and how it fits into the American application process. My name is Jeremy Craig. Um, I started teaching SAT prep when I was a young undergraduate in New York City to make extra money to go to rock concerts. Uh, fast forward 25 years, I'm still doing the same damn thing. So I, I, I like the schedule, I have my summers off, and I just love kids so much. Okay, here we go. What we're going to talk about is the PSAT, then we're going to talk about the SAT, then we're going to talk about the ACT, and we're also going to talk about the SAT subject tests. After that, I'm going to talk about the use of scores, when to test, how to prep, and what it all means. Now, I have a ton of content to get through, so this is being videotaped, and we're actually going to throw this up on our respective websites afterwards. So if I kind of sail through stuff too quickly, don't worry, it's all going to be on the, on the site, and I'll probably like annotate it with some more information on the video later on. I was trying to pare this down, but I've given this talk so many times, I know that everyone wants to cover everything. So I have gotten rid of stuff, believe it or not. Now, PSAT is a practice SAT. This is taken in the States by American students, normally in 10th or 11th grade, to give them a dry run of what the SAT is going to quote look like. Now, importantly, the PSAT has absolutely no bearing towards getting into American universities. The PSAT is administered, the, the universities buy the test data from the, the test administrator, and they start getting swag in the mail or via email from universities you've never heard of. So basically, if you're not an American citizen, it doesn't actually matter. For American citizens, it only matters if you're in the top half of 1%, you might qualify for what's called National Merit Scholar Qualifying, but internationally, you have to be a complete genius to be able to get this. So if you're not American, don't sweat it at all. Even if you are American, eh, it's not that big a deal. It doesn't really matter. What does matter is the SAT. The SAT grew out of a test that was given by schools in the Northeast because they needed one standardized test to give to people. And they could kind of combine that idea with the test that was administered to people that got drafted into the US Army. If you got drafted in the Army in 1942 and you did really well on the aptitude test, you'd be someone's valet or driver, and you'd be have sort of a nice job at Fort Benning somewhere. If you didn't do well on the SAT or the, not the standardized test they give um, soldiers drafted in, you were the guy at the front of the boat that went over to Omaha Beach. You were that guy. Okay, so then it grew after the war, sort of mysticalized, or whatever that word is, and now it's sort of the one standardized yardstick that American universities use when, accepting, when assessing students. Again, in America, we have 50 different states. We have about 300 different education systems. A 4.0 in one school doesn't mean a 3.5 in another school. So they just need one standard yardstick. Now, importantly, your grades are more important than your SAT. Your grades or your IB results represent two to four years of hard graft. Your SAT or the ACT represent how clever are you at taking a test on a Saturday morning. So SATs or ACTs won't necessarily get you into a premier university, but not doing well them might keep you out but your grades are more important. Now, the format changed in 2016, so we talk about the new format. Importantly, there's no minimum score to get into schools X, Y, and Z. And every year, kids get a perfect score and they get rejected because they didn't have enough other things going for them. Okay, so there's no minimum score. And universities aren't even gonna tell you their average, they're actually gonna tell you their median 50th percentile of people that get in. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. Now, it's three and a half hours long. You take it in the morning, multiple choice. Scored on a range of 400 up to 1600. This is the old scale that they had back in the day when I took the test in the 90s. For a while, it was up to 2400. Now we're back down to 1600. Five, four times per year nationally. Next year will be five. We're down to four times a year. It used to be six, but they're having some issues with test integrity. So to keep things legit, it's only four times a year. There are five sections of the SAT. There's reading, which is reading long, boring passages like you see in a magazine, answering questions about them. There's writing a language, English grammar. Remember, remember semicolons and prepositional phrases, all that fun stuff? That's not taught in school anymore, okay? We do. There's math. There are two math sections. One, no calculator allowed. Some people go into a cold sweat when you take away their TI calculators. The other longer math section, the calculator is allowed, and following that, you have an essay. Now the essay is dying a death, and the essay right now is only really required by about a dozen schools in America, including the University of California. So essays, we, don't, we think in probably about 12 months, the essays will be gone entirely. Now the vocab is still tested on the SATs, when we just added context. One of the reading sections has a uh, founding document, so if you know who Thomas Paine or Malcolm X are, that will definitely help you. Now one thing about the SAT is now it looks a lot like the ACT paper version. The big difference between the two, and I'll circle back on this later, is that you have much less time per question on the ACT. 
The SAT can think your way through the AC, the, the SAT can think your way through the ACT is more like a rapid fire round. We have to answer the questions rather quickly. Now, in terms of the estimated median scores, so again, the worldwide average is about a thousand. 1100 is a decent score, those are wonderful schools. We're at Rutgers, St. John's, in New York City, you see where said. 1300, you're getting a pretty rock solid score. 1500, if you get a 1500 on the first test you take on one of my programs, I'll give you your money back and tell you to go out and make a varsity sport or do something with your life because you don't really need much more help. And again, a 1500 will get your foot in the door for just about any American universities, but it won't necessarily get you in. A 1500 will probably get you into Rutgers, no problem, but obviously Duke probably rejects about half the students who score a perfect SAT score. A good stat I like to bandy about, um, Stanford rejects 70% of perfect SAT scores. Yeah. But if you're six foot eight and et cetera, et cetera, you might get in. So, and our average improvement is about 200 points across the board. Now, subject tests. Some universities also require subject tests. These are one hour long. You can take them on the same date as an SAT, but not both. And they test what you're learning in school anyway. The actual topics are, there you go. Now, only take these if you have to. If your last name is Zhang, don't take Chinese. If your last name is Park, you don't take Korean. You get the idea. So the schools that require the, the SAT subject tests are the most competitive American universities. These tests are easier than IB standard level. They're easier than IGSC. They're certainly easier than an AP test. The basic rule of thumb is if you need help preparing for the subject test to get into Caltech, you're not going to get into Caltech if you take Mignini. Okay, so, so if you have a chance of getting into the schools that require these, you should be able to fall out of bed on a Tuesday and just get up, get a nearly perfect score, but then everyone gets a perfect score on these who applies to Caltech. Okay, next one. ACT. ACT is the Midwest. Um, SAT was always the coast. And then the last 15 years, they've had some comp competition, and now they're both kind of neck and neck in terms of which test people take in the states. They're about equal. SAT went up a little bit last year. ACT tests the same things. Um, it's about 80% the same. The metric is a little different. It's a little wonky. It goes 1 to 36, whatever. Um, and then, but the availability is a little bit limited because what the ACT is doing is they're trying out the international market to do this computer-based testing. Now, computer-based testing is a bit like cold fusion. It's always 10 years away. Um, but they're trying to do it internationally. They've run into some problems doing it. Um, no, nothing that major, but some niggly problems. And as a result, most of the professionals I know and the, the, the test prep and certainly the university advising are saying for the time being, look at the SAT harder than the ACT. And certainly you should never, ever, ever do both. That's just crazy talking, okay? You should basically want to look at which test suits you a little bit better and then move forward from there. The upcoming test dates are the 12th and 13th. You take these at a test center in Singapore. You go there, you sit down in front of a computer. They give you an A4 size whiteboard that you can write on to do the figuring. It's all a little bit weird. But you, you are able to take it, but certainly don't take both. More on the ACT. Again, I could talk a year off about the actual differences between the two tests, and people do write a lot about this, and I've written a lot on my website about this. But basically, the ACT also has science, but the science is really reading charts and graphs. The math on the ACT is more advanced, but you have less time per question. And there is an essay as well, but the essay, again, is, is slowly dying to death. All right? Now, SAT or ACT. Any argument for one, I could give you a counter-argument for the other. Basically, what I recommend you do before you start 11th grade, or right when you start into 11th grade, take a sample test of each. And on the handouts here, there's an official sample test for the ACT and the SAT. Do not go to a test prep center to take a practice test. You don't have to. You can take it at home for free. And then see which one suits you a little bit better, looking at the concordance tables that are available for free online, and then move forward from there. And importantly, both tests are accepted without prejudice. So every school in America that would accept the ACT would also accept the SAT and vice versa. Okay, and there's nothing to be gained by preparing for both. That's just a little bit crazy. You should be doing better things with your time, like acting. Yeah. Use of test scores. After you take your test, your scores live at the college board or live at ACT. After you start the application process in your last year of high school, or if you got NS, talk to your counselors, last year of high school, after you start the application, then you're going to use Daddy's credit card to send those scores directly from the college board to the universities. If you've taken the test multiple times, the universities are probably going to say, listen, we just want to see your highest scores. So taking the test more than once is okay. Taking it more than three times is crazy. 
Okay, so taking it two or three times is kind of normal. One other thing, if you have kind of a funky name, if you're from Thailand or Sri Lanka, and your name is kind of long, make sure that whatever uh, shortened or truncated word, SAT word, truncated, whatever truncated name you use is common throughout the SAT, your visa application, and the actual application online. We'd recommend you take the test during the second half of 11th grade. So second half of IB1 would be the equivalent in 20 from doing the IB. Doing stuff earlier than that, there's really no point. Your score is going to get better just through normal academic work because these tests are testing what you're doing in school anyway. So, so I, we heard about a kid just here who took the test in sixth grade. That's just absolutely crazy. I would not accept anyone into my program in ninth or tenth grade. I get asked all the time. Eleventh grade, second half of eleventh grade, even better. Okay, because you got another six months of school and you're going to get better at math. You're going to get better at reading and writing. And a lot of the math content, unless you're in like the, the super smart kid math club class, is not going to be learned until you're in 11th grade. Okay, so there's going to be some stuff. Now, talk to your guidance counselor about this. They know you better than I do, and everyone's a little bit different. But you want to come up with a plan ahead of time so you, these, things, these things don't sneak up on you. The last opportunity to take the test is really October of 12th grade. December is a little bit late sometimes, especially if you're applying early. How to prep. Choose your test date. You work back about six or eight weeks, and then you do a program leading up to there. You, you can enroll in an expensive SAT prep program, and that's what, that's what keeps my rent paid. Or for SAT, Khan Academy has wonderful SAT prep for free, available on the website. Of course, the issue with Khan Academy is you need mom sitting there with a stick, poking you every five minutes and able to do it. Okay, now, you can get better at tennis by hitting the ball against a wall, but if someone tells you how to hit the ball a different way, you get better faster. And that's what SAT prep is. It teaches you how to take the test a slightly different way, and you can get better much quicker than sitting there doing a stack of practice tests. If the tests were such that if you just did a stack of practice tests, you eventually could get a perfect score, the average score in Asia would be perfect. Okay, so it's not like an O level where you just keep studying, 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 and then eventually you're going to crack it. If it was like that, it uses no sports analogy. I'm a very good golfer, but I'm never going to play pro, no matter how much I play or how much I practice. So everyone has their maximum SAT score in them. We get to that level as quickly as possible. You take the test, and then you're done with it. And then worry about the things that you're really, really good at and the things you're quite passionate about. What do we do? SAT prep, ACT prep, that's it. Uh, I really haven't done any ACT prep for the last year or so because I don't want kids preparing for a test that they're not able to take. That would be my worst nightmare. We might do something for June. I don't know yet. I still got to make up my mind. All the teachers are American, um, American owned and operated. Again, I've been doing this since 93. And it's, it's, Test Takers is active in the New York City area, and we're sort of the franchise for Asia. We work directly with most of the international schools in town, and we have programs running throughout the year. Um, the program you have here, just as a sample, this is just our program for, for the for, for, the, for the main test, what we do for our open programs is we rent classroom space at the ISS International School, which is just about 300 meters that way. So it's relatively convenient. Orchard Road location. Um, we have some other programs in terms of test fundamentals and some, some technology programs that you'll get some emails from us about that in due course. Okay, that's it. I, again, I stormed through that pretty quickly. I told you it would. So now we're opening it up to any questions you have from any of the three of us. Um, or obviously, everyone in Singapore is very scared of public speaking, so we'll make ourselves available on the side afterwards if um, we have any questions that way. I, I, I joke, but actually, the, the number one fear of Singaporeans is not death, it's public speaking. <laughs>